Sit down and don't scream, the serial killer told the 13-year-old girl, and then shot her in the back of the head. The mournful list of those sentenced to capital punishment by Mariupol resident Sergei Dovzhenko consists of 19 people. Sentenced and executed the sentence. 19 human lives sacrificed to morbid ambition by one man. He sentenced people to death and carried out his own sentence. He dissected this city with the meticulousness of a surgeon. Only instead of a scalpel, he had a gun in his hand. For four long years he managed to kill innocent people with impunity. Four years the police and prosecutors tried to find the killer, a ghost who left his victims no chance. Traces of his crimes remained in every neighborhood of the city. The first murder was registered in the Primorsky district of Mariupol, the next seven in Ordzonikidzevsky. Then, one murder in Zhovtnevsky district, and the shooting of three people from a police patrol again in Primorsky district, three murders in Ilyachevsky district, the last two in Zhovtnevi. The whole geography of Mariupol and 19 people sent to the scaffold. Not out of jealousy, not in a state of grave mental disorder, not out of carelessness, and not out of revenge for the death of a loved one, but consciously, with deliberate intent. On the evening of May 17, 2002, he was taken. On this day, Sergei Dovshenko went to the case for the last time. In the air of the courtroom there is a barely perceptible odor of Valerianka and Korvalol. In addition to the police escort and grieving people with inflamed eyes, called victims, there is an invisible presence of grief in the hall. In the black robes of the judges and assessors, the mourning clothes of the relatives of the murdered, and the black bars of the cage where the accused sits, there is a kind of universal hopelessness. Hopelessness from the fact that nothing can be returned, neither time, nor circumstances, nor the souls of the innocently murdered. The world is filled with people with a bullet in their chest. It is very hard to bear when there is someone very loved, who also has a bullet in his chest. And the modern law cynically substitutes the concepts of person and murderer. And there is hopelessness in that too. For the state has failed to preserve the life of the victim, but it will preserve the life of the murderer by all means at its disposal. From the pair victim-murderer, in a particular case, the state protects the life of the murderer. Such a stable equilibrium in which the murderer is guaranteed against murder. At court sessions, Dovzhenko is as simple and serious as a crematorium chimney. Ordinary and prosaic weaves a harsh thread of narration about how and for what people died. Without any emotions, politely and essentially. To the question of the female assessor, Didn't you feel sorry for the dead? Sergei Dovshenko answers. Pity. And just as mundanely he will answer the wife of policeman Vladimir Fedorenko, who was shot together with his comrades in December 2000 while on duty in Primorsky district, when his widow asked, After these murders you had nightmares? No, I didn't have nightmares. There is an interesting, in my opinion, historical parallel. In the fall of 1946, the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg sentenced about 60 Nazi criminals to death, and all of them were executed by one man, the then chief executioner of the U.S. Army, Joy Malta. He said that nightmares never tormented him. Dovzhenko's victims won't ask any more questions. Criminalists and sociologists have questions. What makes a person a serial killer? What is his psychological profile? Can such crimes be prevented? We do not know the answers to all of these questions, but the history of their search is almost as long as the history of serial murders themselves. Such crimes were first recorded in the Middle Ages. Just think of Joan of Arc's associate, Marshal Gilles de Ray of France, sentenced to death for mass infanticide in his castle, or the French nobleman executed by Henry IV for killing peasant women whose bellies he had cut open to warm his chilly feet. These murders, however, have fallen into history because they were quite few in number. The murders of S. Dovzhenko will go down in recent Ukrainian history because there were too many of them. God save and have mercy, God save and have mercy. God save the boys with tin eyes and pupils, as if they had puncture holes. Sergei Dovzhenko was born in Mariupol in 1972, graduated from high school. In his childhood, he had neither friends nor enemies. He studied at the Mariupol Commercial Technical School, specializing in merchandising, and served in the army, in the Air Defense Forces Sports Company. He was engaged in boxing, 
In Dovzhenko's asset is the title of twice vice champion of Ukraine in boxing. At one time, he tried to engage in private entrepreneurship in the central market of Mariupol, then worked in the firm Citadel. After his dismissal from Citadel, he joined the law enforcement agencies. Half a year in the police school, three months of internship, and another month of independent work as an operative of criminal investigation of Primorsky District Department of Mariupol, a specialist in the line of property crimes. Colleagues recall that Dovchenko was a mediocre detective, working mostly for his own pocket. Colleagues shunned him as a man of little socializing and secretive, because of the rigid methods of work called bull terrier. He himself will say about himself, I was a gray policeman, no penalties, no awards. According to people who knew him closely, he was known as a pessimist and was not very fond of noisy campaigns. If necessary, became flexible and cunning. He was afraid of failure, and he was also determined to get a foothold in this life. I had a healthy careerism. I wanted to become a colonel of the police, will say about himself in one of the interviews. In 1997, when Dovzhenko was already working in the police, he was arrested on charges of murdering a guard of the Citadel. On the night of June 18, 1997, a robbery attack was committed on the office of Citadel. The guard who was in the building was shot dead. The safe was broken into, from which several thousand hryvnias were missing as it was stated. Some details of the crime suggested that it was committed by persons close to Citadel. Dogs did not react to the criminal. The door to the premises was opened by the guard himself. Near the murdered man were found fired shell casings from PM and serviceable cartridges. It looked as if the gun had been fired by an amateur, who jerked the bolt after each shot. Initially under suspicion of robbery was the foreman of security guards of the firm, Citadel, Valeri D. But he denied everything. For the night he was placed in the Primorsky District Department, where that night Sergei Dovzhenko was on duty from the Threat Department. At night he brought Valeri to his office, talked to him for a long time about something, after which he allowed a telephone conversation. This became known to the operatives. And then they remembered that before serving in the police, Sergei Dovzhenko also worked in the Citadel. Dovzhenko's service pistol, quietly seized from the armory, was urgently sent to Donetsk for examination. The conclusion of experts said, the guard was killed with this weapon. On June 27, 1997, recalls Dovzhenko, about 10 SWAs, two employees of the Internal Affairs Department came to my office and asked me to go with them to the Deputy Chief of the Internal Affairs Department. His office was on the first floor of the new attached building of the Internal Affairs Department. From this office, everything started. Let's remember this date, June 27, 1997. Subsequently, Sergei Dovzhenko would celebrate a bloody Trizna for her twice on June 27, 1999 shooting the family of police captain Alexander Kokin, and, exactly two years later, on the same day, June 27, 2001, he would kill 63-year-old Galina Ivanova and her 13-year-old granddaughter Tanechka with shots to the back of the head. In a neighboring apartment at that time lay another corpse, the mother of Vitaly Shemyakov, Klavdia Shemyakova. When I was detained on suspicion in 1998, continues Dovchenko, I was beaten by the head of Primorsky ROVD Ushkolov in the presence of OBOP officers on the second day after the detention. These officers were Sklyarov, Panchenko, and Vasiliev. After Ushkolov left, I was subjected to electrocution. He would later recall everything to them. He took revenge. He took revenge cruelly and recklessly, lining his way to his intended goal with the corpses of innocent people. After lengthy conversations with the management and then with the OPB operatives, he writes a confession of guilt, admitting to the murder of the Citadel Guard. He was detained, arrested, and placed in a pre-trial detention center. The second examination of the gun, conducted in Kharkov, confirmed the conclusions of the first one. The investigation lasted more than eight months, but, except for the confession of guilt and expert conclusions, Nothing concrete proving Dovzhenko's guilt was presented to the court. Moreover, the third Kiev independent expert examination concluded that the shots were not fired from his service weapon. The case fell apart. Serhii Dovzhenko was convicted of document forgery, considering the entry in his employment record book to be a forgery, and was released after serving a term in the pre-trial detention center. On March 30, 1998, he was released.
The falsification of documents consisted in the fact that Dovzenko submitted to the police personnel department a labor book, in which an entry was made about his previous work not in the commercial firm Citadel, but in one of the state enterprises. At that time, the police had a secret order not to hire anyone from commercial structures. At the investigation stage, another police officer was held together with Dovzhenko, under exactly the same circumstances, related to the entry in the labor book. The criminal case against him was terminated, and Dovzhenko received a term of imprisonment. After his release, Dovzhenko repeatedly tried to get a job, including in law enforcement agencies, but officials categorically refused to do so. According to his lawyer Igor Nadolko, this way the public provoked Dovzhenko's transformation into a homicidal maniac. He entered into a kind of competition with the police. He killed innocent people. Thus he proved the incapacity of the law enforcement system, and as if to rule the fate of his offenders. I was beaten, twisted, Litvin, Shastoritz, Messin, Ushkalov, recalls Dovzhenko. They held key positions in the police of the city, and I took revenge on them. Chekmak died, they took off Shestoritz. A woman died in Primorsky district, also trouble for the police. Ushkalov's son died at that time, and I thought that this was enough for him. Then I moved to the left bank, or Zonikidze district of Mariupol. Messin was working there. There was a triple series of murders in a short time. From the point of view of society, these methods are not quite acceptable, but they are very effective. They took away my future, and I, the meaning of their i.e., policemen's, authors, life. Apparently, Sergei Dovzhenko was driven by hatred towards the regime, to the justice system and the police in general. He had nothing to fear them for. He had something to hate them for. And he was not looking for sponsors. Usually no one pays for the realization of hatred. The hater does everything himself. And there is nothing surprising in the fact that he did it professionally. That's the horror of these crimes. So how should one behave with executioners? Here is a question to which most will always have a purely theoretical answer. The shooting at point-blank range of entrepreneur V. Chekmak and city executive committee official I. Karimov in the late evening of November 19, 1998, was due to revenge against V. Chekmak, who, according to Dovzhenko, had broken his life and prevented him from finding employment in every possible way. At the ongoing trial, Dovzhenko allowed himself to be emotional only once, when the court questioned Chekmak's son, Dmitri. Why are you hiding that you hated me as much as I hated you? He exclaimed angrily. The official of the city executive committee, Ikarimov, as well as the commercial director of the firm, Citadel, Sergei Shaturov, whose hand was almost shot off by the criminal, got under the crush by accident. Dovzhenko did not leave any witnesses alive. It was not in his rules. Therefore, he shot to kill even random people, by fatal coincidence, who happened to be in the same car with V. Chekmak. On that day, only one passenger of that car was unambiguously lucky, Alexander Lokshin, who left V. Chekmak's car a couple of blocks away from the scene of the tragedy. I devoted my life to Chekmak and the police, said later Dovzhenko. They did not nail me, and I had a chance. And he realized his chance in full terrorizing Mariupol for four years. The motive for the murder of Valentina Gladilina on April 17, 1999 in the Primorsky district of the city is simple to the point of banality. Here is how Dovzhenko himself explains it. I killed Gladilina so that Ushkalov, a police official, author, would have problems in his work. When I was detained on suspicion in 1998, I was beaten by the head of Primorsky ROVD Ushkalov in the presence of OBOP officers on the second day after the detention. These officers were Sklyarov, Panchenko, and Vasilyev. After Ushkalov left, I was subjected to electrocution. The court specifies whether Dovzhenko achieved his goal after this murder. Yes, he answers. Ushkalov was removed from his post that year for poor performance. A legitimate question from the court. Why didn't Dovzhenko take revenge directly on the police? also found an answer from Estovchenko. It was not their turn. They were protected by the law, and when they were fired, the chances were equalized. Further, the accused Dovzhenko explains that at that time the deputy chief of the Department of Internal Affairs, Shekhovtsev, 
was removed from his post and transferred to the Ordzonikidze district of Mariupol as head of operational work. Misen also worked there, who, according to Dovzhenko, helped Chekmak to prove my guilt. From that moment, the fate of people living in the Ordzonikidzevsky district of Mariupol was predetermined. Any day each of them could become a victim of the murderer. S. Dovzenko. To remove them from their work, Misen and Shekovitz, author, I prepared and committed the following creamy, the murder of the Koken family, at that time a police captain, author, and staged a robbery attack on them. I was going to kill all three of them. My comrade V. Shemyakov once suggested that I commit an apartment theft from these people who were engaged in currency trading at the market. He showed me the windows of the apartment and told me who lived there. I refused then, but used the information for my own purposes. On June 27, 1999, police captain Alexander Kokin and his wife Ekaterina. Kokina were shot dead as they were leaving the entrance. The captain's mother-in-law, N. Krokaleva, received three bullets in her body but survived. According to her testimony, S. Dovzhenko was not alone at the time of the crime. That day he was dressed in a tracksuit and a baseball cap with a large visor covering half of his face. Shooting on the run, he came at the women like a hurricane. Kroholeva's son-in-law was already lying at the entrance. Her daughter was slowly sliding down the wall, leaving bloody traces on it. I fell and hit my head hard, the victim Kroholeva tells the court. I started to crawl away. He, gestured towards the defendant, author, took a step back, but then came back and made another shot. We must assume, control shot, author. But, there was no shot. The clip had run out of cartridges, auth. A minute later, a man in a light-colored short-sleeved shirt with bald spots like yours leaned over me, pointing at lawyer E. Nadolko, author. He called himself a police captain and asked, Did you see who shot at you? Later I never saw him again. He, Dovzhenko author, was not alone. He was not alone at the entrance. The grief-stricken woman repeated several times. Estovchenko explains the murder of Lyudmila Shevchenko, 58, and her son Sergei Shevchenko, 27, on February Skaya Street on September 10, 1999. This was the fourth murder in Ordzonikidzevsky district, especially with one gun. I wanted to increase the pressure with this murder because the chief, whom I was taking revenge on, had already been given an incomplete official compliance. I knew this from the words of police officers or the press, I don't remember now. One of the 19 episodes, imputed to Estovzhenko, of this bloody epic, the murder of Vitaly Shemyakov. The very one who led Dovzhenko to the apartment of the Kokins. The very one, as it will be revealed at the investigation and confirmed in court by Dovzhenko himself, who sold him this notorious atypical pistol with five rifles in the channel of the barrel. The five rifles were designed for softer recoil, so the hand wouldn't get tired. Dovshenko killed his accomplice on July 7, 2000, killed for greed and attempted blackmail. Shemyakov read articles in Priyazovsky Worker, which indicated the use of non-standard weapons, explains to the court Dovshenko, and knew that he sold me a gun with five rifles. And he blackmailed me. His appetite increased especially after the murder of the Kokins. Before that, at his request, I gave him $100 to $200. Then he called and demanded $1,000. After that, I went to his house and killed him. He took information from the newspaper and from policemen he knew. This murder of Vitaly Shemyakov stands apart also because no gun was used at that time. Shemyakov's throat was simply slit. On the fact of this murder, another man was convicted, innocent of murder and died in the zone from tuberculosis. It is still unknown whether this innocent man was rehabilitated at least posthumously. The mother of Vitaly Shemyakov, by the way, to the last did not believe in the guilt of the convict, and had the imprudence to publicize her conclusions. After that, her hours were numbered. But before this episode in the life of Estovzhenko there were other events, in particular the shooting of a police patrol. That evening, December 15, 2000, there was a heavy fog. I was re-hiding weapons, says Dovzhenko, and when I was walking from Nakimov Avenue to Stroitli Avenue, I was stopped by a patrol. Since I had a weapon with me, and I could be exposed, I used the weapon to kill, and I was alone. In the indictment, there is an unknown person, who as if was together with Dovzhenko author. When asked by the court about this circumstance, Dovzhenko explains, There was a strong fog, maybe someone was nearby, but I did not see. 
But let's return to the murder of Vitaly Shemyakov's mother, Klavdia Shemyakova, committed by the accused on June 27, 2001. A day to the day, two years after the shooting of Captain Kokin's family. This time two more people were killed on Zavarueva Street, Galina Ivanova, 63, and her 13-year-old granddaughter, Tanechka. Here is what Estovzhenko himself told during the court hearing. In order to eliminate a witness and cover up the murder of Vitaly Shemyakov, I staged a murder with robbery. Someone from Ilyachevsky ROVD of Mariupol told me that Shemyakov's mother did not agree with the fact that the court accused another person in the murder of her son, and she did not believe the accusation. I feared her actions, as I knew her as a strong-willed person, and she would try to find the real murderer by all means. As it was published in the newspaper Priyazovsky Rabochi that it is possible that it is a serviceman or militiaman, I was afraid that sooner or later she will remember that I worked in militia. To eliminate the witness, I decided to remove Shemyakova, and, to avert suspicion, staged an attack with robbery on the neighbors. I had information from Vitaly Shemyakin that in the morning there was only a man in the apartment. It was a surprise to me that there was a woman and a girl in the apartment. I planned to kill only the man. The morning after Klavdia Shemyakova's murder, I took a chair and sat on the doorstep, watching the Ivanov's apartment across the street, waiting for their door to open. When she started taking out the trash, I entered the apartment. She tried to defend herself with a bucket. So we went into the hall, she was fighting back with the bucket, but I was just diverting the brush, with the gun, off. She went down in the chair, and I shot her. I saw the girl through my side vision. She snuck out onto the balcony. I followed her to the balcony and took her to the bedroom. I shot her there too. I took the money from my desk drawer. I lost $2,000 at the casino near the theater the next day. $1,000 he kept. Judge Igor Tereschenko's question to Dovchenko. Couldn't the child have been left alive? Short pause. S. Dovchenko. Then I would have been detained that very evening. Another question from the court. When you planned this crime, you did not intend to leave any witnesses? Defendant Dovchenko. Of course not. And finally, the last episode of The Bloody Path in Dovchenko's own comments. The murder of Artur Frokov and Atso Simovich. After this murder, Sergei Dovchenko was taken the same evening, May 17, 2002. I shot Frokov several times, five bullets in the body of the victim, author. Out of hatred for the fact that he brought a stranger that day and gave other parameters of the computer in the advertisement. I did not have a goal to buy a computer. It was with my buddy Linkov. He invited me to go with him on May 16th and look at this laptop. When I expressed doubts about the parameters of the computer, Frolkov answered me. Shtigol, you go and fix the other one. Okay. I came the next day. I came to punish him for his deception. Punish him with death. That's true. We cannot predict how our word will come back, author. Dovchenko further explained, I took Frolkov's passport just in case. It would later be found during the search of Dovchenko's apartment in a specially equipped cache. I left the bag with the computer and cell phone near the nightclub Zvezdny because I met a police detachment and did not want to attract their attention. He did not hide his further plans. In the near future, within a month and a half or two months, I was going to kill Soskovets, Mesin, Igor Reshetniak, Litvin, all employees of various police departments, Oth. I wanted to tell my wife that I would leave to earn money, hide myself in the city and start preparing the murders. When asked by the court, what does it mean to start preparation? Dovzhenko mundanely answers, to trace the routes of movement, places of the most probable meeting, to prepare ways of escape. The harsh thread of the Mariupol executioner's narration weaves mundanely and prosaically. So how should one behave with executioners? Mikhail Weller wrote, Christians like to commemorate Christ's forgiveness, but the Roman legionaries were only executors of orders and the law. Christ was executed by the law and the state, Rome and Israel, and the punishment was terrible. The ruin of Israel and the ruin of Rome, the exile of one nation and the disappearance of another, and the death of many and many thousands. No, God was not merciful to the murderers. The Dovchenko case makes us look at the modern Ukrainian state and society from a special angle. State violence and personal violence, a self-serving police jarek or an executioner squinting at the crosshairs. 
that's all the choice we have. Adam and Eve had only two sons, Cain and Abel, and the human race descended from them. To know only who came from whom, 